You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hey guys, it's me again, Steve Adams of Mighty Blue. Today is the last episode that will be coming out prior to leaving for the UK, though there will be another one next week on April the 11th, by which time I'll be in the UK. The week after that, on the Thursday, we'll have a report on the first three days of hiking the Southwest Coast Path, with our Monday episode coming out the following week, with days four to seven. I'm hoping to publish two episodes a week on Mondays and Thursdays, until I'm done, sometime in June. And with all the preparations I've been putting in for this hike... Yeah, shocker, I know. I've been keeping our recent episodes at or under an hour. Today, we have an old friend back on the show. Clay Bonham and Evans agreed to speak with me about his recent adventure sometime last year on the Cape Roth Trail in Scotland. This was originally intended to be a second section of the show, but Clay is so observant and, to be honest, so informative and entertaining about the trail that I made it a full interview out of our conversation. And as usual, Clay didn't disappoint. We'll hear from Clay in a moment. Then I brought back another old friend of the show. Back when he hiked the trail, in 2016 I believe, Brandon Jacob was given the awesome trail name of The Dude, and The Dude Fest was born. Well, The Dude is back on today with a very interesting announcement that will interest a lot of the class of 2024 hikers. We'll hear what's going on with The Dude after Clay. And just before we chat with Clay, I just wanted to mention that I've been so moved by the number of you who've responded to my Southwest Coast Path Challenge, called Hike with Steve, Benefiting Parenting Matters, a local 501c3, who are doing life-changing work for children and families in our community. And remember, whatever you give in the challenge will be doubled by the Flanza Trust, so your $50 becomes $100, and so on. The link will be in the show notes. So let's get on and hear from Pony, or Clay Bonneman Evans. Our good friend Clay Bonneman Evans, or Pony, is back with us. Hey Clay, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Mighty Blue? You know, funnily enough, I'm, I'm fine, thanks. Um, but somebody wrote to me not too long ago and said, you, you always introduce their trail name, and then you talk about, you mention their real name. But I only ever talk to, talk to you as Clay, really, don't I? I don't know why I do. And yet, I, I know your pony. Um, and you've come on today to share your epic hike, it sounded like and it looked like, uh, in Scotland last year. And it's called Cape Wrath. Cape Wrath, that's like Cape Wrath. So first, how did you find out about it? And second, tell us a few facts and figures about the hike itself. Yeah, so I was going to go back to the CDT last last summer to t- finish the CDT or try to finish the CDT because I broke it over two years, which is not my preferred way. And so I had no plans, but in, in midway through April, I got a, an email from my cousin or a text from my cousin, 32-year-old second cousin. She had a break from grad school. And she said, hey, you want to go hike the Cape Wrath Trail? And I'm like, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> but I looked, I, you know, I immediately looked and I said, well, heck yeah. I had some work. I had some deadlines. But, I, you know, I realized I could probably wrap those up in a couple of weeks and off I went. OK, so uh, so my cousin introduced me to it and um, I was very excited. I've never re I've done small hikes overseas and trekking in, in Nepal years ago, but so I got to go do that. And uh, the trail itself is actually known, or many people call it the AT of the UK. It is widely understood to be the most difficult route uh, commonly hiked uh, in the UK. Obviously, you know, you could throw together all kinds of crazy routes up in, in the, the highlands. But it is, on average, people are going to go 230 to 240 miles, but there are many alternates. Nice. So it can be as short as probably 210, 220, and as long as certainly 250 or even longer because a lot of it's trackless and it does connect with other trails. So you could really make it. I'm sure if you really tried, if you wanted, you could make it into a 300 mile hike. Yeah. Uh, it, it starts at Fort William, and that's where the West Highland Way ends. That's right. And it heads from there, it goes north, northwest to the far northwest tip of the UK, the furthest Northwest point of mainland UK. 
and that is called Cape Wrath. It is, um, it's a windy, wet, wild country up there. <laughs> of course. I happened to go in a so-called dry year, and it was dry. I mean, the bogs were not nearly as wet as they might have been. But often people, they get rain and, and wet pretty much all the way through. I was super lucky. I had a, I had a few days, but nothing terrible. Scotland is a remarkable place for weather. I've I've been in Scotland in the middle of July and with sideways rain watching a golf tournament and yet I've played golf in shirt sleeves and the dry in November at St Andrews it is just so bizarre how different the weather the weather could be up there and and I suppose it's it's tough I suppose uh, to give some context I just I say it's tough in Appalachian trail terms um as a means of comparison so for so you know people obviously listen to the show because of our association with the Appalachian Trail when you looked at it and you heard about it being the Appalachian Trail of the UK does it compare obviously it's not as long but does it compare in terms of difficulty and so on so overall okay so let's pretend the AT is about that long yeah and it is the same terrain overall the AT is still harder there's mm-hmm. no question however all the difficulties or the challenges you, not all, but almost all the challenges you would find on the AT, you're going to encounter on the Cape Wrath. But it's it's all, it's really all up and down. It's up and down, up and down, up and down. That's what you're doing. You're going up and over Monroe's, which are these, any mountain above 3,000 feet, down to Sea Lock, around the lock, up and over, down to Sea Lock. That is the basic pattern. The thing is, there are incredibly steep parts of it that they're probably not as steep as the steepest parts in Maine and New Hampshire, but they're close. Huh. And the footing on there is not the same. It's not a, it's not rocky, rocky, but it's muddy. It's slippery. It's rocky. Uh, it is very easy to take a tumble and it's quite steep. Um, there are track trackless or more or less track. About 20 percent is untracked. So you do a little route finding. And those go through, a lot of the trail goes through bog land. I had a wow. relatively dry year, which means that the bogs were fine. I didn't ever get crazy wet, but my feet were wet all the time, every day, <laughs> no matter what. Oh, so, so, you know, it, it, is, it is comparable in a way to the AT. But what I've said is anybody who's done the AT or the CDT for sure and really the PCT as well, which I consider the easiest of those three now, um, you're going to be fine. It, this is not, you're going to hear a lot of horror stories, but th- you're going to be fine. You can do this. And you say, you say it's, um, there's, there's places where there's not actually a trail. Is that, is that by design or you just make your, make your way up by wherever you want to go almost? Well, this was this is a route that was invented. I forget the name of the guy. He just did it back in like the 80s, I think. He just decided to do it. Mm-hmm. So you've got all kinds of, you've got single track, real trail, good trail. You've got Jeep track, good trail. You've got a little bit of road walking, not a lot on pavement, not very much, just mm-hmm. a little bit. And then you've got marsh walking and, and, and bog walking. And there's just no trail there. But here's the thing. That tends to freak people out, but here's the deal. There aren't any trees up there. The trees that you will find are ones that have been planted on purpose. They tend to be down low, not up high, uh, because the, the Paleolithic people cut all the trees down. So you can always see where you're going, unless it's foggy or rainy. But if you understand how to read a topo map and you know how uh, some orienteering, definitely bone up on your orienteering, you're not going to get lost. You're well, just not. Well, we're going to talk about navigation in a minute, but before we get there, um, obviously you went at a good time because you had decent weather. So whenever you went, it was a great time. But oh, yeah. generally, is that a good time to go as far as you know? What, what, what are meant to be the best times to be out there? Yeah, so generally it's understood that April and May are good times to go, September and October. The problem with the summer months is it's muggy somewhat. It's still not like the AT or anything, but the main thing is the midges. Midges, yeah. <laughs> so midges, which people in the U.S. probably call them gnats or whatever, or little biting black flies, they will drive you insane. I had some midges one morning, just one morning, and that was enough to convince me. And if you go, folks, you can go online and see people on YouTube who've done this trail. 
and you'll see why you don't want to hike in mid-season. I think if you saw any trail in Scotland, you'd see some people complaining about the midges at some time of the year or other. So I I don't know whether you mentioned earlier, what what months did you go in yourself? May. You went in May. Okay, which probably, probably is the perfect time as well. It was great for me, I'll tell you what. And I know the weather, uh, as I say, can be so varied over there. Did you get any bad storms? Because you're right on the North Atlantic there, aren't you? You must be very quite exposed for quite a while, aren't you? You're pretty much exposed all the time. Just just be aware. Now, you, once, you're, once you're down on the sea locks at sea level, perhaps there's, you know, there's a little more protection from hills and a few trees and stuff. But you are mostly exposed the whole time. So think... If you're a CDT hiker, think, uh, you know, all those ridge tops that you're going along, except much lower elevation. I still, even in a dry year, and it was indeed dry, they were having fire problems. I wow. still got I still got smacked by, I think, three solid storms, one of which was a blast for me, honestly. I took off, I had camped and took up, up, up over this pass. I'm not going to remember the name. And um, I just... I was in all my full rain gear and it was hailing and raining horizontally the whole time. Steep, 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 no trail. I was laughing. I thought it was really cool. There were red deer up there. You are that crazy kind of guy though, Clay, to be fair. You laugh at that sort of stuff. Up up, up to a point. And then I get pissed, you know, but I never got pissed that day. And here's the best thing. I came down the other side, the rain tailed off and I was soaked. Everything I had was totally wet. And here comes Inknadamp. Hostel, Inknadamp, I think it's called. Great name. And my God, is that a great little place. Um, It is just, they know how to do it right. Like it's a perfect hostel. And there it was. I walked half mile off the trail to get to it. I hung my stuff. The sun was coming in and out of the clouds. It was windy. Everything dried. I picked up a box. Beautiful. But I really got hammered. And then I got a fair fair amount of rain on the on and off on the last day going up to the Cape. But overall, I was fine. But you can hit gale force winds and storms anytime, really. Wow. And I, and I know you went from Fort William to Cape Roth. Yes. Do people do it the other way? They do. Why? The main thing, that, <laughs> it, well, so so there are kind of a few benefits. Um, going north, you do, and it is a distinct, you really will notice this. You you have a, the prevailing winds at your back. It's just true. Huh. It's a it's an easier, you know, start. It's sort of like think think the AT or the PCT or something. You can ease into it a little better. There's a little more civilization down in that part before you kind of get to the the tougher parts. Southbound, the trickiest thing, honestly, if you ask me, is is oh the trickiest thing about northbound. Sorry is getting back. Once you get to Cape Wrath, there is a cafe up there in season. They do run a little shuttle. And then you take a little ferry across this finger of the North Sea. Or if it's low tide, I just walked across and got my feet wet. If you can't do that, because if it's windy, the fer- ferry won't run. You got a six mile, eight mile walk around. But then you got to get on this one shuttle a day out of Durness. And you need to make a reservation because working people feel that. So you get on the shuttle and it gets you, I can't even remember where it drops you off, but you can get to a place where you can get a train. So the advantage is going southbound. You've done all that nonsense. You've gotten to the Cape. When you're done, you're at Fort William or, as I think would be fun, a lot of people, you could just go on and do the West Highland. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, Which sounds like a great route. It's three or 400 miles. Um, You will have the wind in your face. You are definitely starting with more route finding and you're going to hit the bigger, steeper stuff. I mean, it's steep all the way through when you're climbing, Uh but you're going to hit the more difficult stuff first. So it's a little bit like the AT starting southbound. Yeah. As you know, I can't say the thought of going southbound as the start of your hike on the AT just doesn't work for me. Um, It seems insane. and And I'm not sure how far North Americans or how north North Americans can fly to um, I would think Glasgow or Edinburgh is about as north as you can get. Um, was that the case, or could you have gone? Could you, is there a, is there an airport at Fort William? Or not, not at Fort William. Uh, there may be one at um, Inverness. I'm not actually sure. Oh, of course, yeah, probably is. Yeah, but here's the thing: the rail travel is sweet, as you know, uh, coming from the UK, um, and Scottish Rail is brilliant. So get yourself to Glasgow or Edinburgh. The flights are fairly cheap. It's, it, I was very surprised. 
And then you've got a train where it'll get you right to Fort William if you're going Nobo. If you're going Sobo, from there you're going to have to piece together buses and buses and and shuttles and blah 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 blah. But so uh, I think most people would fly into Edinburgh and Glasgow. And you sent me great notes for this, so I, I and I want to have a quick diversion here. You said you said that you walked from Glasgow to Edinburgh. No one does that. Uh, or Edinburgh, Edinburgh, or Edinburgh to yeah. Glasgow. Why? Because you could. So, so I started hiking with my cousin. We had a good time. We had sort of different priorities. So after about 90 miles, we split amicably. She wanted to go out to Sky and do some things. I tend to be that go, go, go hiker. You know how it is. And do the fun stuff after. Not the not fun, but, you know, the tourist yeah, I know. stuff. I know. So I went to Inverness. And amazingly, my, two of my very best friends from the PCT were hiking the Ayrshire Coast. Yes. And beautiful. so we made arrangements to meet up in Edinburgh. That was brilliant. Um, just, I mean, wow. Uh, it, snake bait and kale, hello, or cake bait and snail. There are many al- alternatives. But hey, guys, if you listen to this, it was so much fun. We met at Edinburgh Castle. You know, we met up there. We went for the tour. We did the whole thing. Here is an aside that I have to tell you. Um, we asked the guy to take a picture. He was American. He said he was from Colorado. I said, oh, I'm from Colorado. Where are you from? He said, Niwot, which is where I grew. I lived for 20 years. I said, hold on a minute. I pulled out my Niwot cap and he's like, no way. <laughs> and then his wife looks at me and starts talking to me. And she said, is your name Clay Evans? And I said, yes. And she said, hang on a minute. She calls her 30 something daughter over. She said, your father delivered my children, including this daughter. Wow. Okay? And the guy knew my sister from high school. So at Edinburgh Castle, it was great. The serendipity of the trailer. Yeah. Snake Bait said, oh, that's pony magic. I'm like, okay, call it what you want. But anyway, so we met there and I had a few more days. I'd done some Edinburgh, I'd done some Inverness. And Kale, the female half of that couple said, why don't you just walk back to Glasgow for your flight? I'm like, okay, let me look. There are two towpaths. Uh, I'm not going to remember the name. I'm sorry. I should. I, I, oh, you know, no worries. No worries. Yeah. Yeah. So there's two canals and it, they have asphalt towpaths and it's about 65 miles the route I did. And I did about 35 miles one day. Yes, my feet were sore, but it was really great. It was like walking through Watership Down or the Shire. Beautiful. Loved it. Long, skinny boats. And then you come to this crazy, you want to talk, the Scottish engineers, they know. They have built, like, do you know what a lock is? You know, you lower the water, lower the water. Of course I do. They built this thing. They built this thing that's like a big mechanical, almost like a Ferris wheel. It's huge machine. And the boat goes in and then it, it, it rotates down a hundred feet and then it goes out in the canal below. Like mind blowing. And this is at the 30, about halfway through. And then the next day I just kept walking. And as I got closer to Glasgow, it was more citified, and then I had some miles walking in to get to my hostel. But you know what? It was great. I mean, yeah, it was asphalt walking, but my God, what a what a great thing to do. I don't I think almost nobody does it. Um, <laughs> I've I, never met anybody who's done it. You're right. <laughs> it was it was a totally worthwhile thing to do. Thank you, Kale, for suggesting. So so was, was that perfect. before or after the, the Cape Roth trial? So after the hike, right, we okay. met up in Edinburgh right, and then okay. I just needed to get to my flight, and I had three or four days, and right. I took two of them to walk to Glasgow. <laughs> of course you did. Uh, so, and in the notes you, you sent me, let's get back to the hike itself, you referred to the ease of hitching, and that yeah. really, that shocked me because nobody hitched in England when I lived there, at least not since the 70s or the 80s. You found it easy. Did you have to hitch I much? I did. Did you have to hitch I, much? I was, I was quite surprised. I didn't need to hitch very much, but uh, – Three times, well, let's see, two times, two times that I did, bam, instant ride, nice people. The guy who, so the trail is about seven miles outside of Alapool, and you can, there's an alternate if you want to just leave from Alapool. But Alapool is one of the stops you're going to make. Nice little port town, and they've got everything you need. They cater to hikers, you know, hill walkers. And so that guy was so nice. He picked me up. He took me to town. He showed me around town. It's tiny, but he showed me where everything was. Um, off, offered, gave me his phone if I needed to call him. Just really nice people, and they were very interested 
in what I was doing. They were not, I mean, my least, my worst experience with hitchhiking was in Wyoming on, on the CDT. And I don't think I got a ride on the CDT. <laughs> so like even where I tried. So I just gave up going into some towns. I didn't do it. Really nice. The people were great. Fantastic. S- Scots are renowned for their hospitality. When I used to go yeah. up there, I used to do a couple of golf tours up there. Yeah. They there was there was an honesty box. You go to the clubhouse if there's yeah. and it says if there's nobody here, just put the money in the in an envelope. There's no possibility they would know what you've put in or whether you haven't put in, which is yeah. just just amazing. And um, and how was the trail itself in terms of resupply options? Because you said you could go into Ullapool. Were there any other resupply options at all? Yeah. So. I guess it's called Kinluck U. I have to tell you, uh, I will criticize the UK or maybe it's just Scotland. Why does every place have six names? <laughs> Why not? Or or what it is is like every place, like it's literally 200 yards away and it has a separate name. So I don't really know. There's there's Shield Bridge. You come to Shield Bridge and there's a series of little communities with a name. There's a hostel there, a hostel in Scotland there, blah, blah, blah. That's a really solid place to resupply. There's one store where you you can do it. And, um, and Ullapool, in my opinion, is a must. Okay. Then the rest of your options are interesting. They're basically hotels out in the middle of nowhere or a B and B all by itself limited, but you can usually buy, buy meals, have, you know, eat up there and, and buy a few snacks or whatever. So most people do send boxes. That is what, uh, my cousin and I did. We just in Fort William, we put together, a plan and a bunch of boxes and sent them. And did they charge uh, like they do over here sometimes? They charge to receive them? No, nope, just you had to pay to mail them, but no no charge to pick up that I recall. Uh, maybe at Inkna Damp Lodge, maybe. I can't remember, but it, it was minimal. So really, I think most people do that. And easy enough to do that in a case. And yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and you've obviously done very long trails before. Was your gear set up the same as usual? Did you have to make a few tweaks? Because you didn't quite know what to expect out there, did you? You were expecting rain, horizontal rain, so on. So what what the bits of gear that you relied upon on this trip, perhaps more than you would normally? Yeah, I brought an umbrella. Loved it. All right. Uh, I would not necessarily have known that, except that just on a whim, I brought it on the CDT for once I was out of New Mexico last year. And hey, man. I got to hide behind it and save myself from a hailstorm. So I was glad to have an umbrella. Uh, I will tell you um, how dumb I am. And my wife knows this. She, So my cousin was like, listen, I have a big Agnes um, Copper Spur 2. If we just stay in the same tent and then split cook gear and stuff. I'm like, yeah. My wife was like, what are you thinking? You know how you are. <laughs> I'm with Jody on this. Be, I'm with Jody yeah, on this. Yeah, you don't want to be in a tent with somebody unless it's me. And I'm like, no, nah, it'll be fine. Well, it, no, absolutely nothing against Isabel. Hi, Izzy. Um, we just have different sleeping styles, different needs, different. It makes zero sense unless you're like married to somebody. So that was not smart. Um, at all. And she had um, her, her charge, her power bank had gone on the fritz. So we were at this little tiny place where there's a pub fun to eat there. Mm. Um, you can really nice, tiny. And the train went by there. So we took a train in Inverness so she could replace that. And while I was there, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to get a bivy. I've never used a bivy before. Oh, really? I really liked it. It is it is a weird experience. Like, it's basically like being in a sarcophagus. But <laughs> it really worked for me. It was fairly lightweight, and it wasn't bulky at all. And it was easy, easy, easy to set up. So, you know, that's kind of how I managed that. Um, anything else special? You know, I always have, well... I usually have rain pants with me so I can use as wind pants also. So good rain gear. I bought special rain gear. I bought non-breathable rain gear from Lightheart Gear in North Carolina on right. purpose. Right, right. Because we've talked about this. Rain gear doesn't work. That's right. So I thought yeah. I thought I would give this a try. It's like, I don't even know what it is. But it works pretty darn well. But wow. you know what? It still soaks through sometimes. Of course it does. So. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 I think getting wet is part of the game anyway. Wherever you hike, you're going to get wet yeah. at some stage and just suck it up, buttercup, you know. Yep. Yeah, I, and I'm, I wear waterproof sh- boots. You don't do, – do you wear trail runners and they're not waterproof or what do you wear? Yeah, so here's the thing. Your feet are going to be wet. And to me, one of the disadvantages of waterproof shoes or boots stays is in. that – it's going to hold the water. Your feet will be wet the whole time right. if you want any chance of having them dry. But here's the thing. 
My cousin brought waterproof socks, which I didn't do. I did end up buying some in Inverness because she said they really helped. They do help. Now, if you go hip deep in a bog, if they're tight enough, you might be okay. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, everybody knows how stinky hiker feet can be. Waterproof socks magnify that by a factor of about 18. So just be warned. <laughs> I think they're probably worth bringing. I, I guess I enjoyed having mine. I got some um, myself, actually. I, I might, try, might try that back if I went on a wet hike as well. And, yeah. And, and being in Scotland, I suspect water was readily available. But yep. how accessible was it? And where did you get it from? Did you get it from taps as you pass hotels or, or, or did you just get it out of streams? Well, there, anywhere there's a settlement, you can get water, which is great. And like I say, there's quite a few. It's just what that means is usually a little B&B out in the middle of nowhere. But here's the deal. You don't have to worry about Giardia or any of the other stuff. So you don't have to treat your water. The one exception would be if you're down where there's livestock cattle, yeah, yeah, yeah. be smart. Don't do it there, but it doesn't matter because you're going to go up the next hill. There will be water even in the dry year. Nice. And you just, I just drank straight out of it. I mm. just, I, you can go with one water bottle because there's always water. So it was a joy. Didn't treat. Nice. Fine. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And, and you mentioned earlier on uh, how, how the, the the Scots attitude, particularly in Ullabal, you said, well, there was such a good attitude towards what they call hill walkers. Mm -hmm. um, and their attitude towards hikers is really something, isn't it, compared to here? You can, you can, you've got the right of way everywhere, haven't you? Oh, yeah. There's a law they passed, and I had just looked it up before, and I'm forgetting the name, in 2003. Um, basically, it's called, I don't know, it's the Scottish Land Act, something, something. And here's the thing in America, you could legally be shot if you accidentally trespass. You have the right to cross even private property there. Now, you want to be within reason and courteous. Don't put your tent up in the middle of the guy's sheep herd. <laughs> uh, and don't, you know, walk by the house to where you can peek into the bathroom. But you literally have a right. It's, it is a very wide-ranging right to walk where you wish. That is an amazing difference. And I found myself, there was one day I had the American mindset. So I was following a trail and it went down and I was like, oh, this doesn't look right. We'll talk navigation later. The trail was obvious, but it doesn't look right according to this, whatever. Damn it. I could see where I needed to go. It was like a quarter mile away, but there was a homestead there. I'm like, shoot, I can't cross there. I bushwhacked back. I've got into gorse and thistles and scratched up and, you know, and went to the end of this long, long sheep pasture. Go, finally got back on the other track. Go into the sheep pasture, diagonally across, get to where, and, and I realized, because here comes another person across the sheep pasture. I didn't have to do that. I saw people go that quarter mile past the homestead. And here's the weird thing. And again, we'll talk navigation, but I was on the right track the first time. <laughs> and I went way out of the way because I thought I couldn't trespass. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah. You, know, you can set up your tent by a little stone wall at somebody's farm. Nobody's going to bother you. It's amazing. That's a wonderful thing. And I, I'm hiking in, in England um, in a couple of weeks' time, yeah, about a month's time. And I don't have that luxury. Apparently, I can wild camp at a lot of places and people won't bother you. But in Scotland, it's almost, it's not, I don't, not suppose, is it enshrined in law? You can camp wherever yes. you like virtually? Oh, right. Yeah. Well, we don't have that on where I'm going to go. But I love the fact that the Scots absolutely do that. Give us a sense of what the scenery is like up there. Okay, so the Paleolithic peoples of Britain cut down all the trees. So, as I mentioned, if you see trees, they were planted and they're generally, you know, in a low location. Sure. So pretty much you're walking across bulbs, all bulbs. Lovely. All the time. Beautiful. Do you like, are you a hiker who likes open vistas? You're gonna love this. And that turns my crank. So you can see for miles and miles and miles. You can see where you're going 25 miles away. You know, if, there, if there's a storm or fog or something, no. But I loved that scenery. I love the, the heathered hillsides, steep, rocky, heathered hillsides. You cross a lot of water, uh, streams and rivers. 
uh, there are really cool uh, features. Are the, are the crossings on bridges, or do you just walk through the water? Some are bridges, and some you walk through the water. Right, right. Yep. Yeah. And I learned on the PCT, I just walk through water. I don't even try to rock hop. If I, although this year it was actually pretty dry, and I could have. I just don't do it. You, there are really neat features for you to see. So those who are into Harry Potter, I have not seen the Harry Potter movies, but evidently the train that takes people to Hogwarts the, the big the big uh, vibe yeah. up there yeah. people tourists go there and wait to take a uh. picture and you <laughs> hike right underneath it the falls of Glomach are 400 some feet high they are the highest waterfalls in all of the UK nice. and they are beautiful it is incredibly steep going down from the falls but really it's fine I didn't find it scary or dangerous at all Coming up as a Sobo would be kind of a pain in the butt, but it's short. I would not, think not so. Long. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Um, I think the, the we'll talk about accommodations later and I can talk about Bothy's, but the sea locks are gorgeous. I mean, the Atlantic water that you are going to come across once a day, if you're hiking 15, 20 miles at least, sure. gorgeous. It's blue. It's beautiful. The sun's up so late. You get this golden sunset, you know, sparkling off the water. There's gorse, which you don't you, want to get into, but you pro- it's you probably, yellow. You probably lost the sun around 10 o'clock, didn't you? Maybe as late, oh, maybe later. later. Wow. Yeah, it was It was light until past 11. And that it awesome. was amazing. Yeah, that, that is And then awesome. it was light again by 3.30. It was pretty cool. So let's talk about navigation. I know it's not enough on far out. So what did you use for navigation? Yeah, I wish there was some on far out. Maybe they don't do it because it's not – it is a route. But there's so many alts, I don't sure. know. So um, there's a book, uh, Walking the Cape Wrath Trail, you, from published by Cicerone, which is a British company. Okay. You can get it on Amazon. It's worth having. Tons of information. It's sort of like the AT guidebook. Uh, be warned, however, navigationally, not a lot, but in places, it appears to me that the guy has not hiked this trail, either hiked it at all or hiked it in a long time. There are places where his mileage is significant. Oh, really? By like, <laughs> that's not yeah, like eight or ten miles. Oh, my God. Good. That's not helpful you, at all. You will wind up with a long day in one place that I can think of. And he doesn't seem to be aware of the difficulty of certain places and, you know, this, that, or the other. But it's a really helpful book. Clay, you Clay, get it. you're a writer. You could do yeah. You could do this. <laughs> yeah, I could. It's also not well organized. So super frustrating when you have to stand there and look at your book. I had it on 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 digital. Sure, sure. You have to triangulate between you, you, there and the next thing you want to get for sure is either the Harvey maps or I think it's better if you get the Ordnance Survey waterproof maps. Ordnance Survey is a British thing. My God, if you're a map person, just get them. Yes. They're kind. They're kind of big, but mail them to yourself so you don't have to carry them all at once if you don't want to. Or they're not going to be that heavy. They're brilliant. And if you get the one to twenty five thousand, it's such granular detail. There's no chance you could get lost if you know how to read a map and do some more. Aren't they online? Can you get them online? Yes. On your phone. You can. Um, you can. I like having the paper. Honestly, um, I mm, so. And OS has, so do the OS app. I signed up for it. I paid it 60 some bucks. I had it. But be, keep in mind, this isn't on there. So you're going to need to download somebody's GPX data, which I did. And, you know, every once in a while, you're way out there. You're not going to be able to access OS maps or Gaia or anything. Sure. Like you, you can do it, but it's, the, you lose all the granular detail that I think is so helpful. You definitely wanted a compass. I advise paper maps, but do what you will. And you're not going to get lost, but it's so helpful if it's raining or you're just not quite sure. You can see, I need to go between this next little bump and this pond. That's mm. what I'm going to do. Yeah. So that's great. And um, what was I going to say here? Uh yeah, those maps are helpful too for side trips. Like if you want to climb up some of these Monroes and different things like that, really well, well worth it. And I, w- I definitely would brush up on your orienteering, just a basic, basic YouTube video to remember how to take a bearing, things like that, in case it's foggy or something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, I, yeah. and I and I understand you did a bit of a mix between camping, hosteling, and as you mentioned earlier on, bothies. So Mm -hmm. tell us about the different accommodations you stayed in. Yeah, so I definitely did hostels wherever I could because 
I like that. I like to get clean. I like to do my laundry. I like to eat it if there's eating available. So I stayed in one, two, I don't know, I think three hostels along the way. And then Bothies. Bothies are four-sided little structures. They were usually farm buildings, yep. out farm buildings, or sometimes a schoolhouse. Very small. And there is a Bothy Association in the UK that maintains them. Oh, they are awesome. They are like the AT shelters, but they're enclosed. Yeah. Mm, mostly there's not a mouse problem, but in a few there's a mouse problem, so be aware of that. But mostly they were great. You what, know? What, and, do you, what do you do with your food? Did you hang your food anywhere? Um, I never, you, for, you never need to hang for predators right. because, or, you know, th- there's no predators at all. You don't no. have to worry about bears. Or no, I mean, my, I mean mice really yeah. as much as anything. Yeah. Else. Mice. So I have a, I carried a, uh, uh, an ursac critter sack, which is defense against small creatures. And then I just used the odor proof sack. So I didn't, I hung in one bothy, uh, because it was notorious for mice. I never saw a mouse. Huh. So yeah, you want to be mindful of that. People cut up firewood there. They come around, and so you can often build a fire. Nice. They're great. And look, this is not a, a heavily trafficked trail, but you will meet hikers there, and they're very international. Really, really a great experience. That's really nice. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love the idea of meeting people from different countries as well. Oh, so, it's great. So you got to the end, although yeah. not without crossing the Royal Air Force bombing range. That's uh, right. Firstly, how did that work out, and did they bomb that day? <laughs> yeah, so so – on your approach to Cape Wrath, it should be your last day. I don't even remember how many miles it is. Probably six miles of this. There is a bombing reservation. And the, the RAF or the Department of Defense in the UK actually does aerial bombing raids there. And the area extends out over the ocean. So you have to be, you have to be proactive. You have to do this somewhere where you're going to have a Wi-Fi service. You're not going to have it most of the time. You need to check on their website to see when they have scheduled bombing and you don't want to go through there then chances are you would yeah chances (laughs) are you wouldn't get hit but you know you don't want to be there and here's the weird thing at the southern end of the range there are these flags that are supposed to tell you whether it's open or not green yellow red whatever oh should be right they don't ever change them so (laughs) the red flag's always up and it makes people nervous i knew to just ignore that I knew they weren't bombing this day, and I just I just climbed the fence and went across. So you do have to be mindful of that. <laughs> That's funny. And they only they they don't bomb. There are certain months, and I think May is one where they don't bomb, or they bomb almost not at all because of nesting birds. So like May and into early June or something, it's the least bombed time of the year. <laughs> And yeah. I'm just looking at the various highlights. You've mentioned most of those highlights, but you also mentioned Sandwood Bay has some of the most mm. beautiful water I've ever seen. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, I think of the Atlantic. I live on the Atlantic now as kind of dirty and gray. And this is clear sapphire blue water crashing on this sort of pink, yellow sand, cool. very steep beach. People go in there. The, the the thing you're supposed to do is get naked and run in to end your hike. No doubt you did. Think, no doubt yeah, you did. No, <laughs> I didn't do it, but I would have, except the beach is very steep. It looks to me like I'm a good swimmer. I just was like, nope, I'm not getting in that water because I think you could get sucked out to sea. <laughs> it is gorgeous, though. There are these standing stones, natural standing stones out in the water that you can see cliffs. There are, there are dunes. There are green... You know, heather covered hills behind yeah, the little like river. Everything. It is unbelievably gorgeous. Wow. Really cool. And there are two two bothies sort of near there. All right, nice. Now I know you did a blog on the trek, so I'm with your permission, I'm gonna add that to the show notes as well. But you know, I really appreciate you telling your story because it's a place I'd never really heard of until you started talking about going there and then somebody else I know went there and so on. So I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story about the Appalachian Trail of the UK. Yeah, it is. Honestly, it's an up and coming trail. It's obviously getting more attention. Most of the people I saw were Europeans. In fact, I didn't see another American besides my cousin, but my prediction is, and not in a bad way, hikers are discovering this thing and they're going to be more and more. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Yes, I lucked out with weather. 
no guarantee of that, but if you're prepared, I, I really, I, here's what it did for me. I'm probably retired from the multi thousand mile trails. I wish I weren't. Maybe I will again, maybe repeat one of them, but this taught me that a 230, 250 mile trail, whatever can be just as epic and just as fun. It is really worth it. And honestly, in a weird way, I want to compare it, not visually, but to the Colorado Trail in terms of difficulty, because it is about the the elevation gain per mile is about the same as on the Colorado Trail. Really? And, but it is steeper. There are places where it's steeper. Uh-huh. It's great. I hope people go do it. And listen, Scotland is an amazing place. And I think what you said, attack it if you go from if you go from the north down to Fort William and then on the uh on the West Highland Way, that's a fabulous trip. So that's something yeah. that people could reconsider doing. Or if you're going no boat, do the West Highland Way, get your feet wet. It's it's much easier. That'd be your run up. That's that's like coming across the desert on the PCT. By the time you hit Cape Wrath, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna be, you're gonna have your trail legs. Yeah. Okay, buddy. Well, look, great to talk to you as always, and uh, we'll catch up soon. Okay. Absolutely. Thanks. See you, mate. Bye. Bye. I always love chatting with Clay. For a start, he's smarter than me, and I know he won't mind me saying a little bit crazier than me as well. And he always embraces whatever he's doing at the time. He's a bloke who lives in the moment, and that is a good thing. Clay has shared a few links that I'll include in the show notes, so check those out as well. Before we catch up with the dude, my heartfelt thanks goes as ever to our donors. And this week, we have two weeks to cover, so thanks to the following recurring donors. Brian Alsop, Bruce Brinker, Jessica Diaz, Gregory Gerpner, Hugh Ickreth, Melanie Swisher, Michael Garsh, Kevin Eastman, Small World IFT, Anne Dobson, David Santi, Mike DiCello, Alan Troy and Jens Lebheider while Mark Ford gave a generous contribution, adding a note that said, have dinner on me, Mighty Blue. Thanks, Mark. I did. Thanks to all of you. You keep it real for me. Now, with an exciting announcement for hikers and trail angels, here's Brandon Jacob, or The Dude. Well, um, you met this guy about, I don't know, 400, nearly 400 episodes ago. This is Brandon Jacob, who was the star of our uh, episode 20, I think it was, The Dude. Hey, dude, how are you? I'm doing good, Steve. How are you doing? I'm still trucking along, <laughs> still putting these episodes out there all these years later. It's crazy, isn't it? It was that long ago. Yeah, you know what? It's, it's I, I celebrated my 10th anniversary uh, you know, trailversary the other day, you know, 10 years ago, and it's just feels like it's whizzed by, which is a sad reflection of our lives, of course, whizzing by. Um, but you've actually since uh, hiked the PCT with bugs. And I I met your wife once when, when I, I was going to go to the John Muir Trail with you. Um, but That's she was, right. I don't, I'm not sure she was bugs yet because she wasn't actually hiking, was she? She was not bugs yet. No, no. She, uh, she hadn't done her first mile and I uh, I dragged her along to the PCT in 20, 2022. Right. And she didn't seem terribly keen on the idea of doing it back when I met her anyway. <laughs> yeah, it it uh, it became this, uh, I don't know. You know, Steve, it's just suddenly, suddenly someone says, let's go, <laughs> let's yeah. go live in a tent for six months and, and off we go. Yeah, it worked out. And you're, and you're heading to the Camino later this year? Yes, we are going to uh we're gonna go in August, I believe, and, and take a take a walk over there. Beautiful, beautiful. Now you're we're talking about um something quite specific to you and actually named after you a dude fest. So first up, tell us about the original dude fest, which I believe was at Trent Grocery Store, which is near Dismal Falls, isn't it? It was. The original Dude Fest started when when I was doing my through hike in 16, I also was doing a little fundraiser um, to raise money for the National Wild Turkey Federation, which nice. is a conservation group uh, that is focused on the restoration and re, uh, repopulation of uh, wild turkeys throughout the country. Hmm. And it was kind of like a how many miles you do and people's pitched in on, you know, I'll support you a dollar a mile, that sure, kind of thing. Sure, sure, nice. Well, Jimmy, who owns Trent's Groceries, 
is a member of the National Wild Turkey Federation in Bland County and got in touch with me while I was walking and said, hey, I'd like to you know, put on a little, a little something for you and a couple of your friends uh, when you come through. Yeah, and, and what happened was, as we know, right, <laughs> you know, that's a couple, couple weeks out and hey, there's going to be a little party at Trent's Grocery when I go through and someone called it a dude fest. I had already gotten my, my uh, trail name by then <laughs> and uh, dubbed it a dude fest. And by the time we rolled into Trent's Grocery, I, I think there was about 70 people. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but that was a bit of a mess that night, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was uh it was a uh it was a good time for sure. That's, <laughs> that's for sure. I'm not I'm not sure Jimmy Jimmy expected seventy people, but we made it work. Fantastic. And, and had a great time and and subsequently later did another dude fest up in Killington. But that's, that's right. That's right. That's yeah. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the reason we've actually got you on there was part, quite apart from the fact that we're congratulating each other for having been doing this for ten years nearly. Um, on June the first this year, you've got another dude fest. What's going on? Well, for for as many of these years as pass on the on the through hike, Jimmy and Randy, who 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 now works at uh, Trent's Grocery, he also was part of the original dude fest, putting it together. They've always said they wanted me to come back and do something else. And, you know, Steve, timing just never worked. Yeah, sure. Until now. Right. And so what we're going to do, Bugs and I are going to go up and we're going to go back to trail days. Haven't been back since 16 or since I went through. Wow. wow. And uh, Yeah. And so what we're going to do, because Trent's Grocery is at mile 610 mm -hmm. and it's in far out. Um, and, uh, what we're going to do is walk from trail days as far as we could get, uh, and Randy's going to pick us up and then we're going to go finish setting up for uh, the dude fest, which again is June 1st at the Trent, Trent groceries campground there in Bland, Virginia. And what, what's it going to look like this year? Is it, are you, is the plan to recreate one before or make it bigger, better, brighter? Because you're going to be, if you're just going to be out of trail days, you're going to have a bunch of people coming through around that time. I presume the timing is not accidental. No, it's not. And as a matter of fact, I talked to Jimmy and Randy at the store and they said that that's typically when the slug comes through that. Area, right, right. June, right around the first part of June. And um, so we, we expect it to be, you know, it, it, it's a little bit tough planning something from, you know, I'm down in, down in Texas, but, you know, talking to those guys continually and it's really going to be designed to be um, a trail magic event. Bugs and I are going to kind of, kind of get that piece of it going, but we're obviously seeking and looking for other people that will participate. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously the store on location. So hikers are going to be encouraged to go buy a 12 pack of beer as well. Um, <laughs> they don't need much encouragement yeah. for that, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And and we're putting together, you know, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing, you know, monstrous. But we are going to have uh, some local pickers, bluegrass pickers, nice. uh, cornhole. We're going to have a bonfire. Uh, there's going to be no reason for someone not to stop if you're coming through that area at that time. And Does that so, make sense? Yeah, of course, yeah. But so that's the day. Is it going to be an all day event? Because that that you know that that could be fun, or or is it going to be um, just starting, say, late afternoon? Um, we're going to kick it off in in you know midday, and, and and we haven't really figured out exactly how late. You know, I have to remember I'm not hiking, right? Well, I, I mean, you know, I'm not hiking, and hikers might not want to go to you know. 12 at night and, and probably won't have music till 12 at night because it is a campground as well. Course, course. I haven't really figured the, the, that piece out yet, but it's going to be an all day, definitely, definitely all day kind of affair. That's awesome. That is. If you remember from, from the campground, you could access dismal falls a lot shorter than going around on the Appalachian trail. And my vision might be that some people might, get there early 
decide to stay the night at the campground, enjoy our party, and they could even slip over to Dismal Falls for a couple hours and then get back. Yeah. I don't know the exact distance from the store to Dismal Falls, but it's a lot shorter than when you get back on the trail and wind back around. Yeah, it's a cut through. You can hit, you can actually, there's a parking lot there, isn't there? You can hear it through by the water. So I, I, yeah. I, I can't remember the, the actual path there. So there's going to be music again, as you say. Um, do, you, do you want people to reach out to you and say, I'm coming or I'm not coming? Are you trying to gauge some numbers? And, you know, this is why we're putting it obviously on the podcast. Hopefully people, if they're going to be out there, they'll tell their friends. And Because you don't want a thousand people turning up. <laughs> it may not be a thousand, but how, how do you want to want people to play it? You just want people to be aware it's there and turn up if you can or just let you know if they're coming? Well, you know, Steve, you know, it's, it's always fun to live by the seat of your pants. And I, I think I've <laughs> become an expert in that. But, yeah, that would be a problem if, if a thousand people showed up and we were only ready for 500. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would certainly, mo- most importantly, you know, we are absolutely open to hear from other people who might want to participate in the trail magic side of it. Okay. Right? I mean, well, that's imagine, that's really where I was going. Like a, that's really where I was going as well, because you know, obviously, the more, the more people are going to be there, the more help you're going to need as well. So, yeah. can people reach out to you then? Absolutely, reach out if if you're planning on coming, or reach out if you plan on helping. Yeah. Reach out if, uh, hey, I have a, you know, I also play music, or I also do this, and this cool. could be fun. Cool. It, it, you know, it, it, just like the original Dude Fest. That um, sounds cool. It's intended to be a little bit like, let's put something together and, and see how fun it gets. Yeah, close. Very so nice. The, the more people that reach out to me right now, the, the better it could be. So how can they get hold of you? Uh, let's see. Do we want to do? Do, do we want to do my uh, text number? Do we should we, should we do email? Let's do t- let's do text number. That's fine. Okay. So the t- uh, the number. This is the number. So, so, so I read it out now. Seven one three. Four four three, eight three one one, and I. I by the way, I, I urge people, don't take the piss. No, <laughs> reach out to him if you're going to be there. Want to help? Don't just just call up out the blue because there's a lot. Could be a lot of phone calls or text messages. But look, you know, I'm. I wish you well with this. I wish I, I wish I could be there. I'm still going to be in the UK trudging around the uh, southwest coast path. But look, have a great time and, and really great to talk to you again. And um, and I, I'm. I was shocked when I saw the bugs was actually hiking. So I, I encourage you to continue hiking and, uh, and enjoy the Camino this year. Okay. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. I'll, uh, I, I, I very much appreciate it. You enjoy your hiking as well. Okay, buddy. Stay, stay in touch. Cheers then. Bye. Bye. Sounds awesome. <laughs> and like a headache the following day. So nice of the dude and bugs to give back to the trail in this way. I know that trail magic takes many forms, and I know that not everybody is happy with these big hiker feeds, yet I can guarantee you there will be people out there this year on a very, very limited budget who will love something like this. So instead of knocking what a former through hiker wants to do for hikers, just embrace it. And if you're nearby, contact the dude and offer your help. I'm sure he'll be delighted to hear from you. And after we stopped recording, the dude suggested I added his email address, which is Brandon at contractorscfo.com. He told me not to forget the S. But anyway, he prefers texts, so go with that. His phone number is 713-443-8311. Hope that this gets the support that it deserves. Anyway, that's another one in the books. But I want to tell you about next week's normal show, which will feature Brianna DeSanctis, an amazing woman who recently became the first woman to complete the American Discovery Trail, both north and south routes a trail of nearly 7,000 miles. We had a terrific chat the other day and she'll be here next week. I'll also be giving something of a follow-up after my wonderful weekend with six friends back on the AT as we did the Virginia Triple Crown, so don't miss that. By the time you hear me next week, I'll be in Britain and counting down the days before I hit the southwest coast path. I'll see you next week. <laughs>